What does it all mean? This is where the archaeology has been found. Oh, hi, how are you? Look at that. I, I need a, a planter. A shrine to a belly button. This is a rock of salt? Look at that. No one gets into this, but no one. Whoa, don't take me too far. Now that's naked archaeology. What if I told you that some 2,200 years ago, in this amazingly spectacular setting, there was a great empire? And the people who ruled that empire controlled the trade routes, the spice route. And guess what? They didn't do it through military might, but through smarts. Good business sense. And what if I told you that they also were great builders? They built cities, they built great structures, and they built a capital city in a hidden crevice. And what if I told you that these people magically appeared 2,200 years ago, and then some 400 years later, they seemingly disappeared? They were called the Nabateans. And this is Petra, their capital city, one of the new seven wonders of the world, and the place where Indiana Jones found the Holy Grail. But 2,000 years before Indiana Jones, starting in 200 BCE, the Nabataeans spent almost 400 years carving a spectacular city into three square miles of rock before suddenly disappearing. And they left almost no written records. So for centuries, their identity has been shrouded in mystery. Who built this ancient wonder? Clues in the Bible and local traditions suggest that they shared customs with the ancient Israelites and that they may even be related to Moses. I'm traveling through the ancient Nabataean kingdom in modern-day Israel and Jordan because I want to know who the Nabataeans were and if there's any archaeological evidence of a link to Moses. What history tells us is that they began as a nomadic tribe and first turned up in written records in 312 BCE. At the time, they lived in tents and crossed the desert in caravans. Ovdat, in the Negev Desert in southern Israel, was the most important caravan station in the Nabataean Kingdom. And I think there might be a clue here that helps link the Nabataeans to the Israelites. Most of these ruins are much later than the Nabataeans but evidence of a Nabataean settlement under these ruins were found by archaeologist Moti Hyman, who was excavated here for 20 years. The church is beautiful, and it's sitting on top of a Nabataean location, but I gotta tell you, what gets me, I'm trying to figure out the people that would come into the middle of a desert. I mean, it's not a place that I would ever start building anything. It's, they're amazing. Well, let's start with what we feel now, a nice breeze. The entire country, the entire Middle East suffers now from terrible heat. It's heat, very hot. yeah. But here it's cool. It's cool. You, stick, uh, uh, very, you feel a very nice breeze. And if you are under a roof, in a shadow, it's like living in North Europe. But you're in the middle of the desert. Yeah. So the people that are trying to attack you, they would die of heat. Yeah, exactly. And you would be sitting up here, cool, yeah. drinking your lemonade, no problem. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> They're smart, those the Rolling lemon. stones on top of them, yeah. They would be listening to the Rolling Stones? <laughs> the, oh, you would be Rolling Stones, stones down roll, on top yeah. of your attackers, yeah. 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 Underneath the Byzantine ruins, archaeologists have unearthed the remains of Nabataean structures and clues about their language and traditions. So what we have here is an honest-to-goodness Nabataean inscription? Absolutely, you can see that it was a nice stone uh, carved, decorated around. Here, let me splash some water. What does it say? Well, it mentions a guy that uh, donated, uh, gave a donation to the temple. And, I mean, it's clearly Nabataean. What is interesting, which is also typical... My Nabataean is rusty, but I can tell that's, that's what Nabataean. What is typical to the Nabataeans, and this, this reflected, is that the letters are Nabataean, but the text itself is in Aramaic. And Aramaic was the international language of that time, of that part of the world. Some scholars think that the Nabataean alphabet is the basis for later Arabic writing. Now you see it, but the evidence here shows that they spoke Aramaic, the language of the ancient Israelites 
and later, Jesus. Still, it's not exactly a connection to Moses. Lots of people spoke Aramaic. But Moti Hyman tells me that if I follow the Nabataeans' road back to Petra, I'll find another clue. So I drove back to Jordan, and right on the road to Petra, less than two kilometers from their ancient capital, you can't miss the evidence that links the Nabataeans to the Bible and to Moses. I'm driving through southern Jordan, looking for clues linking the ancient Nabataeans to the biblical Israelites. And in Wadi Musa, the modern part of Petra, two kilometers from the ancient Nabataean capital, you can't miss the evidence that links the people here to the Bible and to Moses. Modern Petra, a souvenir shop. You wouldn't think it had anything to do with the Bible, but right over here next to the souvenir shop, you have Moses' spring. The Bible says that Moses struck a rock instead of uh, talking to it, and the water came out. God said, talk to the rock. Because he struck it, that little misdemeanor caused him not to be able to go into the Promised Land. He had to look at it from Mount Nebo and die outside the Promised Land. This, according to local tradition, is the rock. And look over here. There's a spring. There's a beautiful spring. Look at this. It's fantastic. This isn't archaeology. It's tradition. But this tradition tells us that a thousand years before the Nabataeans, the Exodus may have passed right through Petra. Today, it's tourists who pass through here to see the Nabataeans' most famous accomplishment. It's hidden behind a thousand meters of rock, and every year, countless tourists make the pilgrimage down this crevice to the Nabataean capital and one of the most famous buildings in the world. This is what the tour guides tell you to do. They tell you to turn around so that you don't see it kind of, you don't see it until you have to see it. And I have to tell you, I'm genuinely excited. I mean, I'm in Petra, I can't believe it. I don't want to fall. <laughs> well, few things leave me bre um, breathless, uh, speechless. This is one of them. Wow. Many of the things we know about the Nabataeans have gone from fact to legend. Scholars and adventurers have written that the Nabataeans were brilliant military strategists, hiding their capital in a crevice, making it immune to attack. They built a monastery, a treasury, and a Roman theater. Even today, tour guides and books say that their skills as architects and engineers were way ahead of their time. And that adds to the mystery, because in 312 BCE, these people were nomads. And just a hundred years later, they started to build this. How? Recent archaeological discoveries helped to explain this mystery. I'd give 10 years of my life to solve this mystery. There's no mystery. Dr. Konstantinos Politis has excavated in Petra and is an expert on the Nabataean world. Now, the question is, is that the Nabataeans, who mysteriously stride onto the stage of history, really started nomads. How does a nomadic people suddenly create what is still one of the wonders of the world? Well, we're not totally sure where they came from. Whether they were fully nomadic or not, we also don't know. We have very little evidence for the beginnings of them. But what we do know is that they had, they profited hugely, primarily on the trade of frankincense, incense, was burned constantly in all the Roman temples, the pagan temples of Greece and Rome and everywhere, including here. And it was like gold or like oil today. They, they made an incredible amount of money. So yes, they were good businessmen and they sold this product and they had the secrets to where it was in Yemen and modern Oman. So did that change them from nomadic life, let's say, to city dwellers or what? Once they had this great wealth, they needed 
permanent urban centers, market towns like Petra, and then with their extra money, they wanted to emulate the people that they were selling it to, the Greeks and the Romans. So perhaps they imported architects and builders to build such monuments. It's a bit like being nouveau riche today. So basically when we talk about, wow, the Nabataeans did this and that, basically the Nabataeans came into a lot of cash and then they hired the best Greek-Roman architects. That's it, exactly. With their great wealth, they carved monumental buildings in the rock. The Roman theater, the monastery, the tomb of the Roman soldier, and the treasury of the pharaoh. Each of these buildings has elaborate stories connected to them. In fact, the legend of the treasury is that the pharaoh of the Exodus pursued Moses here and left his gold for safekeeping. While we're here, I just in front of this classic Nabataean icon, right? It's what we all identify with Petra, with Nabatea, with, you know, Indiana Jones. This is a classic. It's called a treasury. Yeah. Is it a treasury? No, it's not a treasury at all. It's, there's an urn, if you can see up there, there's a, a large pot. And it's actually been shot at by the Bedouin Arabs for years. They think there's gold inside. So there's this tradition that it, this is the treasury because we, there's this pot of gold, literally. Literally, at the end of the rainbow or the gorge in this? Yeah, uh, yeah and the end of the gorge is a pot of gold. And you can see the, 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 the shots that they... They shot through. because they wanted the gold to yeah, come out. But nothing there, obviously. Dr. Politius tells me that the treasury isn't a treasury, the monastery isn't a monastery, and the Roman theater isn't really Rome. The tomb of the Roman soldier is a tomb, but its only connection to the Romans is a statue that looks like it might be a soldier. Today, archaeologists know that most of these structures are tombs. For years, scholars and writers speculated that Petra was an ancient necropolis, a city of the dead. Others said it was a thriving metropolis. But excavations have now revealed that the relationship between living and dead was far more complicated than anyone would have guessed. In Petra, the Nabataean capital, it turns out that things aren't really what they seem. Some of the facts I thought I knew have turned out to be myths. And so far, there's not much evidence of Moses and the Israelites here. Scholars and writers and tour guides have written of the imposing structures carved into the rocks and the impression they must have made in ancient times. But excavations by Professor Stefan Schmidt have revealed a surprising picture. So you are coaches as well? No, no, I'm a, I'm a naked archaeologist. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. The Nabataeans saw a completely different Petra than the one we see today. Um, so this is one of these 900 and uh, something tomb facades in Petra, but uh, it was not visible in antiquity from this spot here. I mean, you came up the site and you wouldn't see anything of it. Meaning what we see today, that we get impressed right away by these tomb facades is not the way they were really designed? Just follow me, exactly. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I love mystery. You see that we are standing here in massive built structures. So from the point where we are starting our visit, you couldn't see anything of the tomb, but maybe, maybe the pediment, but that's all. Oh, the built Sometimes. structures have collapsed. Exactly. The rock structures have remained. Exactly. That's why we see one part of the puzzle, but exactly, not the other. Exactly, exactly. Seeing only part of the puzzle and believing that visitors to the city were confronted by hundreds of massive tombs, scholars believed that Petra was actually a city of the dead. But a remarkably simple discovery here has helped to prove that the living and the dead shared the city much more closely than anyone had suspected. One question, yeah. is, is this a living quarter where I'm looking? At least partially it seems like, because um, from the built structures we do have information that there were heated rooms, for instance. Really? We had fragments of both floor heating and wall heating. That means that some of these rooms, I can't tell you which exactly, were heated. But how exactly uh, the working together of the living and the, the dead uh, functions, we are still far from understanding. It's amazing actually that you can get to so much by figuring out that they were heating the rooms, because heating the rooms means that they're living and dead together, and that opens a whole door to their way of thought. Exactly, exactly. 
Archaeologists are still trying to understand just how the Nabataeans lived and what they believed. What archaeologists and scholars believed, and is still accepted as fact today, is that Petra was a beautiful and cultured place where reverence for fine architecture was the rule, and that it was built here at the end of a thousand meter long gorge to protect it from attack. The strategic cunning of the Nabataeans is rarely questioned. But new discoveries about their day-to-day -day life are casting doubts on these assumptions. It's a banquet hall. This is where big shots got together to have a big meal. Exactly. Dancing uh, girls, the whole thing. Well, that we do not know, but there's a good chance that uh, exactly uh, these features were present as well. The result you can see is a kind of ancient Las Vegas, uh, which is uh, probably uh, um, it's, it's not a bad comparison after all. The city of Petra, as we can see it today, is one of the most uncomfortable places in the whole area. They wanted to show that they do have the money uh, to, to do this tremendous work. Uh, wasn't it for defense reasons that they came here? Uh, it's uh, the baddest place to defend no, this. No, but I thought this, the, the gorge was a natural defense. But the gorge is a myth, um, because there are many other tracks leading to Petra. The gorge gives access from one side, but there are three other sides which gave access uh, to the city of Petra, which are not the gorge at all. So what you're saying is that there were a bunch of nouveau riches who really wanted to show off. This is exactly the term uh, one would use. I mean, they were a little disappointed in those uh, Nabataeans. I had a... At first I thought they were architects, then it turned out that you just hired architects from Alexandria or someplace. Then I thought they were these incredible uh, strategic defense guys, but it turns out that they're really building an ancient Las Vegas. It's a little bit sad. Yeah, I wouldn't turn it uh, that way. Um, they were very intelligent, smart and flexible people, uh, that would be my guess. A good businessman. And definitely good businessman, yes. So many of the facts that I thought I knew have turned out to be legends and myths. Maybe the story about Moses is a myth too. But I've been told that I should look for clues in the mountains around Petra. So I'm going to where few tourists go, because in the place the Nabataeans considered most sacred, there seems to be evidence of Moses. Almost everything I've read and thought I knew about Petra and the Nabataeans turned out to be wrong. Now I think that the strangest part of the story that the Nabataeans are linked to Moses may just be a story after all. Still, I've been told to climb to the highest peak in the city and there, there's evidence that the Nabataeans knew of Moses. I need more water. It's 50 degrees Celsius or 122 degrees Fahrenheit and if I survive, I may find what I'm looking for. So what is this place? This is the highest place of sacrifice in Petra. It's very impressive. It's Look at it. It's the most giant. impressive part of all of Petra and the Nepotane world for that matter. I mean, for me, this is much more impressive than, than you know, the classic view of the, the treasury. I mean, this is, this is huge. And look at this, you see here the altar. I may be, they're both altars, but Maybe that's where they have a feast or they did libations. And look at this. This is the high priest. What's over there? Well, this is where you would actually put your sacrifices, your primary sacrifices. This is where a lot of paganism happened, eh? Mm-hmm. So is this where they would have sacrificed the animals? Well, the way it's cut here, and there's a, a, a trough underneath for some kind of liquid, i.e. blood, to, 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 to collect. It looks as if this is where the actual initial cut would have been. From the high place of sacrifice, you can see all of Petra. You can also see south into the land of the biblical Midianites, where Moses led his people on the Exodus. And to the west, you can see Mount Hor. In the story of the Exodus, Moses accompanies his brother Aaron up Mount Hor, where Aaron dies and is laid to rest. And to this day, pilgrims still make the day-long journey to the top of Mount Hor and the place identified as Aaron's tomb. The historian Josephus writes of Aaron's tomb here. And Josephus lived at the time of the Nabataeans. So the Nabataeans must have known of Moses and his brother Aaron. 
But did the Nabataeans believe that Aaron was their ancestor? A startling discovery among the people who still live in the mountains around Petra suggests that they did. It turns out that the people who live here claim they are descendants of the Nabataeans. But there's more to their story. And I was introduced to a scholar who documented a startling discovery. By the way, this is a first, and you're not gonna see this anywhere but on the Naked Archaeologist. We're going to interview a scholar who's passed away. And here it is. So I'm standing at the grave of Dr. Ken Russell. He's buried here in the landscape that he loved so much. But what he said is very much a lie. There are three tribes of Bedouin living here. Hi, Mr. Several thousand people. How are you? 1,500 of those are Badul, the people Dr. Russell was most interested in. After living with these people, he published an ethnographic paper. That means a paper that researches what the oral traditions, what the ethnicity, what the culture says. And he found that the people who are living in the area of Petra call themselves to this day Bani Israel, the children of Israel. Now, why should that surprise us, given that tradition is that that, that highest peak that you see behind me is Aaron's tomb. And below it, there's an Iron Age site, a site that dates back to the Exodus, that if that's Aaron's, Aaron's tomb, that's got to be an Israelite site. Today, given the Middle East conflict, it may not be popular for a Bedouin tribe to declare Israelite ancestry and the Badul prefer not to talk about their origin. But a scholar who lived and died amongst them concluded that it was not so very long ago that some 1,500 people living in the shadow of Aaron's tomb still claim descent from Moses. He's a total man.